So, hopefully you have some notion of what glycolysis is. Uh, but to give you the basics of it, glycolysis is literally glycolysis. Glyco meaning sugar. And lysis meaning to cut. So it is the cutting of sugar. That's literally what it means. And chemically speaking, that is what is going to happen when glycolysis occurs. Uh, glycolysis is, for most organisms, the first and sometimes only step to harvesting energy uh, from chemicals that you take in. Uh, now, organisms from bacteria and archaea all the way up to us all do glycolysis. And in fact, the glycolysis that we do is usually, though not always, very similar. Um, in fact, it's usually exactly the same. Uh, and sometimes there are some alternatives. So there are a few different ways to cut sugar and get energy from it. Um, Basically, what's going to happen is we're going to split one molecule of glucose. It's usually glucose. It actually can be other sugar molecules, but glucose is the most traditional, the most studied, the one most organisms prefer to use. This molecule of glucose is going to be slowly and through a multi-step process split into two molecules of pyruvate. This is what we call an exergonic reaction, which means that it releases energy, and that energy can be captured and stored in the form of ATP. Uh, in addition, it's going to yield uh, four high-energy electrons, which will be stored on NADH. Um, to, for a little bit more information on NADH, you can look at the uh, What is Metabolism video. These two pyruvates still have a lot of energy on them, and depending on the, uh, the organism and depending upon the needs of that organism, they can either be siphoned into the citric acid cycle, uh, where more energy can be extracted from them, or they can be recycled through fermentation. Um, now, there are several different varieties of glycolysis. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is the traditional glycolysis. It's what most people mean when they say glycolysis. Uh, but there are other ways that glucose can be used. And I'm going to talk also about some of those other alternate glycolytic pathways. Let's start off with the basics. So here we have glucose. Glucose is a six carbon sugar that I've represented as this hexagon and I've made it nice and bright yellow to indicate that it has lots of energy. Uh, during glycolysis we are going to extract electrons. We are going to oxidize the glucose and we will reduce NAD plus into NADH, which will then store these electrons. These are high energy electrons, by the way, um, that can be used to do work, to do electron chemistry. Now, if you watch the uh, um, the uh, uh, what is metabolism video, when you oxidize something, um, it usually either breaks or uh, it either breaks a single bond or it forms a double bond. Uh, 
Uh, and in this case, what's going to happen is uh, we're going to break the single bond, and that's going to be what cuts uh, the glucose in half. So what happens to this NADH after glycolysis is that the, well, there's actually a couple of different options, but in respiration, uh, in aerobic respiration specifically, uh, the electron energy, these electrons that are captured in NADH, are going to be transferred through a big lung process called the electron transport chain, uh, and they will eventually end up on oxygen. And they will reduce the oxygen, and when the oxygen is reduced, it turns into water. So ultimately, the electrons from glucose go to NADH, and then they are transferred ultimately to water. This is a very energetic process. It releases a lot of energy, and that energy can be captured to produce a lot of ATP. Uh, by the way, so what I'm describing here is aerobic respiration. Aerobic means using oxygen. There are some organisms that do anaerobic. Respiration. And it's still respiration. And respiration means that we're going to be using the energy of electrons to make ATP. With anaerobic respiration, the difference is that we're not using oxygen, we're using something else. This is something that's done by some microbes, particularly bacteria and certain species of archaea um, that live anaerobically, so without oxygen, and will find something else to put the electrons on. Um, but they're still going to be using some molecule to carry those electrons away. Something's got to carry those electrons away. And in anaerobic respiration, you're still going to be running your electrons through the electron transport chain. You're still going to be generating gobs of ATP. It's just that they're going to end up on something else. So let's take a good look at glycolysis. By the way, this particular type of glycolysis is called the uh, Emden... Meyerhoff Parnass or EMP glycolysis. This is the traditional glycolysis. You go to a textbook, you look up glycolysis, this is what you're going to see. Um, so if somebody just says glycolysis, assume that they mean the Emden Meyerhoff Parnass glycolysis. Uh, I will often refer to this as EMP glycolysis just to make sure that you know specifically which one that I'm talking about. But the same also applies to me. If I just say glycolysis, this is what I'm talking about. So uh, glycolysis breaks down into three stages. The first is what's called the energy investment stage. In the energy investment stage, you actually have to spend energy. It's going to cost you energy. Uh, you may have heard the old adage, um, you got to spend money to make money, which is pretty true. Uh, it's difficult to make money if you don't have any money already. So you've got to have some energy to make more energy later. And that's going to be in this section up here uh, where you have a couple of different steps where you're going to add phosphates from ATP to help 
prime the pump. The second stage is the lysis stage. This is really just one step. Eh, one and a half steps. Where we're going to take this six carbon sugar from glucose that we just added some energy to, and we're gonna break it in half. And we're gonna break it into two different things, uh, what's called G3P and DHAP. But then we're very good, quickly going to take the DHAP and convert it into another G3P. So we've ended up with two G3Ps. You don't have to memorize that it's G3P. I'm just using that to explain it. What you need to know is that we added energy to it and then we cut it in half in the lysis stage. And then the third stage, the energy conserving stage. This is where we're gonna get the energy back out. So we've got two three carbon sugars here, all right? And we're going to do the same thing to each of them. So basically everything that I described is going to happen twice. All right. We are going to uh, take some electrons out. And we're going to use that to attach some stuff to it, a phosphate in this case. So we're going to generate an NADH, except it's going to be two NADHs because we've got two molecules. Then we generate, uh, we rearrange stuff here in a very exergonic manner, and that's going to yield some energy that we can capture by forcing it to uh, make some ATP for us. So we're going to generate some ATP here. And then we're going to generate some more ATP in this last step. And we're going to end up with two things called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. Uh, we will have made in total two N-A-D-H and four A-T-P. Now up here we used two A-T-P. So our net is going to be to ATP. These ATPs are generated through what's called substrate level phosphorylation. What that means is that there's an enzyme uh, and and this enzyme is going to bind in this case, it is uh, 1,3-B G3P uh, right there. And it's also going to bind A, D, P, and a phosphate over there. And this enzyme 
really, really wants to go energetically into a different state. Because this 1 3 bis phosphoglycerate or whatever, you don't need to memorize that. This thingy up here really wants to turn into this thingy here, which is 3PG. All right. But the only way that that can happen is if the ADP picks up a phosphate and turns into ATP, all right? So just in order for this to move forward, the ATP has to form. And so the ATP is what we call a substrate of the reaction. And so that's why it's substrate level phosphorylation. But what you really need to know for this is energy investment stage consumes two ATP. Lysis stage splits it in half. Energy conserving stage gets the ATP back out, gets four ATP back out, and gets two NADH. And you need to know that this ATP is made by substrate level phosphorylation. All right, so that is the emden meyerhoff parnass glycolysis pathway. Uh, an alternative to this is the pentose phosphate pathway. So remember what EMP glycolysis made. Uh, two um, NADH, two ATP. And I'm going to quickly exit out of here and get back in so that my drawings go away. Okay. The pentose phosphate pathway is an alternative to EMP glycolysis. Many... Not all, but many organisms, including us and including E. coli and some bacteria, uh, can also do the pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway is going to start the same way as glycolysis. It starts with glucose. And it's going to end with a uh, glucose six, uh, no, with a, uh, sorry, with a glyceraldehyde three phosphate, G3P, which can be fed into the energy conserving stage of glycolysis. Uh, the differences are, first off, note that the pentose phosphate pathway is going to have all of these arrows going off to the side. And that's because it makes precursors. Precursors are building blocks. With glycolysis, what you end up with is basically something that you're going to either get rid of or something that you're going to just burn further down. All it does is extract energy. With pentose phosphate, you are making things that you can make other stuff out of. You're not just breaking down the glucose, you're breaking it down into these bricks that you can then build other things. Uh, specifically, uh, you are making ribose 
phosphate, which is a five carbon sugar, hence pentose. Pentose means, pent means five, os means sugar. It's a five carbon sugar. And this is something that you have to have to make nucleotides. The, your DNA and RNA are made out of A, T, G, and C, and U, if it's RNA. And those A, T, G, and Cs and Us are attached to ribose or deoxyribose. And so if you're going to make more A's, T's, G's, C's, and U's, you need more riboses. So this is the way that you can make riboses. The other thing that you should note about pentose phosphate is that, see up here, instead of making NADH, you are making NADPH. NADPH is almost exactly the same as NADH, right? It looks almost exactly the same. It functions almost exactly the same. The only difference is that it has a tag, a phosphate, on it so that you can tell them apart. Why do we care about NADH versus NADPH? Well, um, it's sort of like you might have a checking account and a savings account. And that's because you want to keep track of your money for different purposes. And uh, so your, uh, your checking account is money for spending. Your savings account is money for saving, for building up to a new future. And uh, your, your cells do something very similar with electron energy. NADH are electrons for respiration. They are electrons that you are going to get more energy out of and use to make more ATP. They are electrons for catabolism. And I'm going to go ahead and put that up here. NAD H equals electrons for catabolism. NADPH is specifically marked for anabolism because sometimes when you are making new molecules, you gotta add electrons into the mix in order to change them or help build them. So N, A, D, P, H equals electrons for anabolism. And they're just labeled separately. They're uh, like they're equal in energy, but if something is on NADH, then it is usually going to go off and be metabolized and turned into ATP. And you wouldn't want that to happen to all of your electrons because then you wouldn't be able to do anything anabolic. And you have to be able to do anabolism in order to like survive. So which pathway you use is going to be dependent upon what process is more predominant in the cell. If the cell is doing a lot of anabolism, it's going to be making more NADPH. If the cell is doing more catabolism, it's going to be making more NADH. Glycolysis makes NADH. Pentose phosphate pathway makes NADPH. But there's a problem, right? So the pentose phosphate pathway makes NADPH for anabolism, and it makes precursors, which you also need for anabolism. They're the building blocks that you're going to be building things out of. Uh, but the pentose phosphate pathway makes 
one net ATP. Glycolysis makes two net ATP. So EMP glycolysis makes twice as much ATP as pentose phosphate glycolysis. And that might or might not make much of a difference. If you're an organism where all of your energy is coming from glycolysis, then two versus one is a big deal. If you are an aerobic organism where like two of your glycolysis is from, or two of your ATP is from glycolysis and like 34 are from oxidation um, or the, the um, oxidative phosphorylation, then, well, okay, so 35 versus 36 is not a big difference. So if the organism is very, very poor on energy resources, EMP glycolysis is going to give you a lot more bang for your buck. But if the organism is very rich on energy resources, it has plenty of energy, it doesn't have to worry about conserving every penny, then the pentose phosphate pathway makes more sense in some circumstances if you are doing lots of anabolism, which is related to growth. All right, here again, I'm going to just clear away my drawings. And there is another alternative pathway as well called the Entner Dodorov or Dodorov pathway, uh, sometimes called ED glycolysis. Um, the Entner Dodorov pathway makes, it's kind of a compromise between the two, but it's not an awesome compromise between the two because it makes one net ATP, one NADH, and one NADPH. The Entner Duodorov pathway is mostly done by organisms that don't know how to do, that never evolved the capacity to do EMP glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway. So it kind of does the job of both, right? But it doesn't do it very well. It's going to give you a little bit of NADH, a little bit of NADPH, and a little bit of ATP but it's not going to give you as much ATP as EMP glycolysis does. So um, organisms that do ED glycolysis usually don't do EMP glycolysis. I'm sure there are a few exceptions to that rule, but uh, that's generally the way it goes. All right, so those are the, um, uh, the glycolytic pathways that I want.